Not oh, late. Okay, noting the hour and the presence of a quorum, I'll call the um, special Mardi Gras edition of the Finance Committee to order. Uh, my apologies for not send, adding to the agendas that I sent out that you were supposed to show up in costume. I know. Uh, the first item is public participation. Seeing no members of the public, we'll move to the third item. The Kelly's Corner presentation and the North Acton Fire Station uh, have been flipped on the agenda. Um, but we will get to both. We have a pretty full meeting tonight. Um, if it seems like I cut you off arbitrarily, um, you may take your revenge someday when you're the chair and I'm a member. But uh, we will get through this agenda. All right, with that, we'll go to the North Acton Fire Station. And we have two men in uniform, not in costume. And uh, I believe they told me between the two of them, they have 72 years of experience on the Acton Fire Department. So, Chief, why don't you introduce yourself to the committee? And so I'm Chief Robert Hart. Uh, this is Deputy Chief Robert Vanderhoof. He usually goes by Bob. I usually go by Rob or Robert. So, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to stand at the podium. You may the presentation. If it, as, lo as long as it works, you can stand. <laughs> Brian can help you. So uh, North Acton Fire Station has been a topic for a long time. Uh, 1970s is when we first started conducting some studies on having uh, a North Acton fire station or a presence in North Acton. So we, we've had multiple studies over the years and as this endeavor grew in interest this year, we decided to bring in municipal resources who, who gave us a management letter or a kind of a condensed uh, analysis of all of the studies we've had and be able to just bring some current data to the table to make it realistic for today. So municipal resources put, helped us put this, this together to uh, help move forward. Uh, currently, our stations are deployed and the ages of the stations are, are represented on this map. So our Acton Center station right across the street here is our, our current oldest station, uh, 1951. The town's first fire station was actually on Windsor Ave in West Acton, built in 1903, which the building still exists, uh, but we don't use it anymore. So West Acton was built to replace that uh, in 1958, and in 1961 or two, uh, South Acton was built in the old schoolhouse uh, property. And in 51, we had 3,500 residents in Acton. And 61, we had 7,000, and today we have roughly 23,000 residents living in town. So our, our mission in the residents we protect has significantly grown over the years, uh, but we're still deployed with the same business model of three stations. So, you know, it kind of interests me, and we have a lot of citizens in the north that don't get the uh, pleasure of being served as well as the bulk of the town. So. That seems a little unsafe, a little unfair to me. So we're charging the way to see if we can build a four station. So some of uh, MRI's major concerns when they did their uh, study, which was quite uh, in depth. They spent a lot of time with myself, the town manager, other members of the department and members of the town. They looked at past studies and records and, and took a lot of our run data uh, from our reporting software and, and came up with a bunch of recommendations. Now, first and foremost, that our existing fire stations are pretty old and no longer effectively or efficiently meet our needs. Our apparatus, uh, our mission of becoming an ALS department uh, has significantly grown over the years and the stations are just really small um, and we don't have a lot of the safety features built into them that we should have. So they're basically recommended that these stations need to be upgraded or replaced. Now obviously that's a long-term uh, goal, but nonetheless, our stations don't really fit our needs. 
The other concern is that fire and EMS coverage in North Acton is lacking. Uh, as you saw on that map, we have zero presence up there. Um, significant development has occurred over the years and response times no, are way longer than they should be and don't, uh, they're not on par with other response times within our other areas of town. So this is, uh, the map on the left is showing our current fire stations with a mile and a half circle and then again a two and a half mile circle around each station. Just kind of give you an idea of um, well, the insurance services office which Bob got to spend a lot of time with today, um, comes out and they give us recommendations that a fire engine should be within a mile and a half of its response entities or homes or, ser or people they serve, and a ladder truck should be within two and a half miles. So these circles just kind of represent what an ISO rating would be looking for, and it's obvious uh, North Acton is well underserved. So the map on the right indicates uh, a Harris Street proposed North Acton fire station. So part of that MRI study w had some response times. So the map on the left indicates our current model with three stations. Uh, the red areas in the northern section of town indicate a greater than six minute response time. Uh, the gold is four to five minutes or five to six, I can't see the key, but um, nonetheless, if we add a fourth station, which is indicative of the map on the right, we significantly reduce response times, bring a lot of that area into uh, a two to three minute response time and significantly add a presence in North Acton, which is what we'd like to see and accomplish with this endeavor. Some more recommendations from MRI is you know, the town should really needs uh, to move forward with the process of building a new North Acton fire station. Um, the town should give primary consideration to 6668 Harris Street. We do own that parcel of land, the old fishing game. Uh, it's a much more uh, builder friendly site than the 2A and 27 track that we in years past looked at. Uh, it's better for traffic. We're not dealing with a major, two major arteries of uh, traffic flow and trying to get in and out of a bad intersection. So uh, they feel and we concur that this is just a, a great spot up there. It's pretty well centrally located within our North Acton district, if you will. Uh, so it's just a great location. And the fact that we own it really helps. Uh, so after we build the North Acton Fire Station, they were further recommending that we expand or significantly upgrade the Acton Center Fire Station, and that is to help redeploy and centrally locate our ladder truck, our shift commander, and, and possibly admin to the center station, which is right across the street here. Uh, better deployment of resources within the town. Uh, further, um, you know, we have a huge service gap in the North Acton area. We've had this for many years. We've known about it for many years. And it just seems like it's time to take care of these people in North Acton. Putting a station up there would certainly reduce travel distances and response times to emergency incidents. You know, with all the benefits of that, potentially saving lives and limiting property damage during fire type incidents. It also helps achieve a normal first unit on scene response time that the NFA, NFPA asks us to accomplish. And it might not sound like a lot, but the more incidents we have in North Acton with extended response times of seven, eight, nine minutes, it brings the town's average down. So no longer are we able to meet a response time of six minutes or under. Uh, you know, it keeps creeping up. So that doesn't look good for the ISO ratings or, you know, it's not great that we don't meet that NFPA benchmark. So uh, eventually, if everything's built out, we've met, touched on this before, the ladder truck can be shifted to the center, shift commander can be brought to the center, and we can better allocate our resources throughout the town to mitigate any emergencies that may occur. 
So back in 07, we were kind of in the same dilemma. The town appropriated monies to design or partially design the North Acton Fire Station specifically for the 2A27 uh, site. So this is uh, just a rendering of that in 07, uh, showing a three bay design with you know, administrative or day-to-day -day support operations on the left. This particular design is very common through fire stations that you see. Uh, you know, Groton's fairly new, Sudbury's fairly new, Hudson's fairly new, Littleton, um, Westford, and they all kind of encompass this similar feature, you know, apparatus on one side, admin on the other side, you know, dress them up with different facades on them, but for all intents and purposes, it's the same type style uh, here in New England anyway. So what we're asking for, and uh, you know, just a, um, a little more than a seat of the pants schedule for this new station would be, you know, the 750,000 that we're asking this April town meeting to fund. So that 750,000 came from phone calls to neighboring towns who were in the process of or, or just finished uh, station builds. So we feel that number is, is accurate for us. Um, same thing with construction estimates, uh, 7.5 million, although an arbitrary number based on what we believe we need for square footage and in square footage pricing, uh, you know, gets us in that area. And again, these are proposed because uh, we haven't gone to design, so we don't fully know the actual hard answers to these. Based on our schedule, we'd like to go to construction bid in fall of 2019, uh, shovel in the ground in spring of 2020, and occupancy of fall of 2021. So this is what you know we're beginning uh, on this journey. So, uh, so our long-term plan is a first and foremost get the North Acton Station built, um, major renovations to Station One to help balance our staffing and uh, apparatus deployment in town. And kind of the big question is we need to, to address uh, staffing levels. So all along the way, selectmen, you guys have asked, you know, do, can I uh, staff this new station with our current employees? So the answer is yes, we can physically do that. But the real answer is, you know, we're, we're not doing anything efficiently if we do that by spreading two personnel into each station. So we, we're really looking to bolster our staffing levels by eight personnel. Um, that will help place our second ambulance in service. Uh, currently we see, have seen a large uptick in what we call multiple incidents at the same time. So we're going on two medicals simultaneously which time we have to call in mutual aid to take care of that second uh, medical. Or if our second ambulance is available, because it is cross-manned with the ladder, uh, it puts the ladder out of service. That's not a paramedic ambulance. We have to call in other paramedics. And that severely reduces the available uh, manpower for suppression efforts. And I know a lot of people say we don't do a lot of fires, but we do a lot of fire-related stuff, whether it's burnt food, uh, you know, dumpster fires, alarm investigation, water problems. There's so many things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis that's not medical. Uh, we would be remiss if we didn't maintain a, a full-fledged suppression staff. So this is our, our program. This is our intent. This is our vision. Um, We'll open it up to questions. Thank you, Chief. Um, my recollection from Budget Saturday was some, something like 40% of the runs go to North Acton. That is correct. Yeah. And, and as a resident of North Acton, um, <laughs> say, for instance, I had a heart attack. What, what would be the difference between a four-minute response and an eight-minute response? Well, there's a 10% reduction of survival rate every minute that you're in cardiac arrest. So it's not looking good for you, sir. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, 
it's significant, <laughs> not to make light of that, but it is significant to get first responder, uh, AED, oxygen on board, um, the sooner the better. Uh, we've had what we call STEMI, so STEMI's is basically a heart attack, there's funny little bleeps on your EKG, and they need immediate uh, cardiac intervention, usually with a cath lab. We've had four or five of those the last month that we ship right to Leahy. So even if you aren't in cardiac arrest, the level of care we're able to provide immediately for you uh, versus going Emerson, them having to diagnose that you're having this problem, then getting a transfer truck, getting you to a facility that can handle that emergency um, is just, it's unprecedented. It's wonderful service that our guys are providing to the citizens and all those people have walked out of Leahy. So. Um, we're really proud to be able to offer the citizens of town a, a wonderful service. So it's not necessarily, you know, the big one, if you will, but it's making, uh, you know, walk out of the hospital care uh, much better. So. Okay. Um, Tom. Chief, does the uh, seven and a half million cover the three uh, fire trucks that you need to put in those three bays? Would that be... Additional, or will you just be redeploying what you've got? That's Talk a great, uh, great question, Tom. We wouldn't be asking for new apparatus at this time. We, we're on a pretty uh, fairly uh, robust replacement schedule right now, so we're hoping uh, to not ask for additional resources. We can redeploy what we have. I'm going to go down the line. Dave, you got anything? Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Um, this is a little out of left field, but do you have a sense, that you mentioned the additional staffing levels, do you have a sense that like how Acton staffing um, per population stacks up against like neighboring communities? Uh, that's a great question. I haven't done in-depth studies, but uh, we kind of revolve around ladder truck staffing and ambulance staffing. So a lot of towns have followed our business model of the past of cross-manning a second ambulance with the ladder truck. Um, so Sudbury has done this, Concord has done this, we have done this, Westford as well. And all those communities have hired additional staff to maintain the ladder truck and staff a second ambulance. Uh, kind of alluded to before, our fire calls are still of significant uh, impact that we don't want to give up that suppression side of the house. Uh, but at the same token, medicals have increased so much that we really can't take care of that. So that doesn't sound all that bad for Acton, but now I used to be able to call Sudbury for an ambulance and now I'm getting, well, you know, Chief, we're busy, can't get there right now. Same with Concord, same with Westford. So the ability to use mutual aid like we used to in years past is diminishing. So we're really looking to change our business practices and take care of a couple of medicals at once instead of just one as in years past. That's the real driver for the staffing, not necessarily the new station. So it's kind of hand in hand, but staff is important regardless of their station. Yeah, that segues to my next question, which is how do you think like Acton service levels, like including ALS and, and, every, and everything stack up against neighboring communities? So we're really lucky to live in such a great area, not only Acton, but the surrounding communities that have really taken care of the uh, fire departments and the fire demands of their community. So we stack up pretty well. Um, you know, Maynard's such a small, condensed community, it's a little hard to compare to Maynard, but certainly Westford is a, a little similar to us, Concord, Lexington, Sudbury. Uh, so we, we, we compare in, the, in a number of runs that we're doing, um, and all those communities, like I said, are adding staff. So that's what we're looking at. Thank you. John? Sure. Um, so the seven and a half million dollars, Chief, would cover the, the building of the new North Acton station? That's our intent, yes. Okay. So that's kind of a, you know, a, uh, educated guess on a number. I understand. Um, and then how far out would be the upgrade to the Acton Center station? Uh, well, that depends on you guys. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> well, what would you like? Um, you know, the sooner the better. The, the station is old and cramped. Uh, it's better, the sooner we can get our ladder truck allocated properly in the center of town, the, the more comfortable I would be. Um, but, you know, we'd have to talk with, you know, planners and whatnot to see where that lies. I, I haven't um, 
spoken about that or asked about that. So I say as soon as we can, but what does that mean? I, I, don't, I don't know. And then, and then the, the upgrades to the uh, West Acton and South Acton are further out. Certainly, okay. yes. Thank you. So we don't want to put everything on one. I understand. Budget, so. well, the, I guess to clarify, John, the, there is, I think, money in this uh, budget on HVACs, you know, for some of those. But they're not being ignored. They're, I think some of the work's getting done that has to get done. But, you know, yeah, complete renovations, that's out there somewhere. Thank you. Roland. Thanks, Chief. I was uh, recently with the Cub Scouts at the Central Fire Station. Excellent. I was near the Central Fire Station, so I really appreciate that. And it is definitely cramped. You don't have a lot of space. Um, so I guess at that point, you wouldn't know how much would be to renovate that's that one to bring it up to where you need to be. Or I guess if you're going to replace it, you're going to be looking at about another 7.5 million, roughly, or thereabouts. I would think. One would surmise, yes. Chase. The uh, design money is at $750,000. Is that for just the one site at Harris Street? That is correct. We really narrowed or focused in on the Harris Street site. Um, <clears throat> a lot of controversy with the 2A27. Like I said, the traffic patterns, the lights, the, the slope, the uh, the uh, little league fields really having a hard time uh, justifying trying to build there when there's such a nice site at, at Harris Street. So the school pro building project is going on concurrently as well, uh, and they're asking for uh, more money than seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. But considering the size and scope of these two different projects, um, you're looking for approximately. Uh, was that a, a tenth of the total cost? Whereas yeah. uh, on the school side, they're looking at more like a twenty, uh, more like a fortieth of the total cost. So I'm just curious, what happens if this seven hundred fifty thousand dollars is, you know, vastly overstated? What happens to the funding if uh, if you don't use it, and do you really anticipate using half the cost of a building that's many, many, many times the square footage? Uh, so those numbers came from conversations with the area chiefs. Uh, so I'm, I'm basing their design, uh, or our design fee, based on what they were telling me. So um, what would happen to the funds if we didn't spend it? I would assume it would get rolled back into the construction. I'm not 100% sure on that. Maybe Brian can answer that. Yeah, it's, it's pretty technical, and, and Steve Baird may be able to, to answer this better than I can, but... <laughs> But uh, I think Jason, if um, so, so, if we requested the 750 and design came in at 500, we have an extra 250 thousand dollars. I think the plan right now would be to ban the 750, then go to permanent borrowing. So I think, big picture wise, uh, we can probably roll that forward into the final issuance when we would go for construction. So I think, um, I think that's what the plan would be at that point. Okay, just seems like a lot in comparison to the school project. Mike. Yeah, I think this makes sense, and obviously <clears throat> it's uh, long overdue with a lot of the growth and development in the North Acton area. It's, we can certainly justify that. Um, with regard to the design study, <clears throat> uh, you know, Miniman uh, cost uh, $724,000 for our $144 million project, but it's, you know, I think a school is also much more complex but if they, uh, you know, I, uh, if they hire a design firm, an engineering firm that specializes in uh, life safety and, uh, you know, fire department designs, and, you know, it, it costs what it costs. And there's probably a lot of technical nuances that we're not aware of, but I suspect it would come in, the actual cost would be, since it's just one building and it's, all, all as you already said, it's, the same fire station that's built in, uh, you know, every other town. So it's not like they're creating uh, <clears throat> something that's completely new. So I suspect there'll be some savings there. Um, but uh, you know, it's, we'll see what happens. But <clears throat> I'd like to see this thing move forward. And uh, you probably won't know how much it really uh, the budget will be until you 
really uh, go through that first phase of design development and um, you see what other problems you are going to be faced with. So I'm comfortable. Christine. You um, mentioned that we don't see an increased need for trucks and other vehicles going forward, even with the development of the new station, correct? Currently, yes. <laughs> Um, but you do see an increased need of eight additional staff line. That is correct. Um, my understanding for the need in increased staff is to handle the fact that we're having more medical calls at a time. Correct. Well, more calls in general. Medical seem to be the uh, prevalent one, but there are fire type calls mixed, okay. mixed in there. I understand that you, you can't have a situation where you can't send out your ladder or your ambulance because you've got one or the other going out, are we going to really be able to increase the um, response to other things? If It sounds to me like we're getting one more vehicle on the road yes. with this increased staffing. So what are we really getting? Could we hire two more people to, I'm, I'm all for this project, I'm all for getting more fire support and medical emergency support out there. I just want to understand where that so all fits in. More staffing question. Yeah. Uh, so we operate with four ships, and each of those ships currently has 10 staff on it. Two guys, girls ride the fire engine or the ambulance, and we have a shift commander as well who, who kind of pulls all three of our stations together and um, oversees them. So like the, the officer of the day is our captain. So <clears throat> that's, that's uh, either an ambulance and a ladder out of, out of station two, that's an engine out of station three, it's an ambulance and an engine out of station one. So that's our primary ambulance is station one, that's where our medics lie. Our South Acton station with the ladder truck and the ambulance is not staffed by paramedics, so the additional staff is, is a step toward making our second ambulance paramedic level. That's a big part of it. Um, but each, each medical response, uh, we send an engine and an ambulance to. And people always ask why, and there's lots of reasons why. Uh, it's not always what the radio or the telephone 911 is reporting. Uh, seems like most people, when they get sick, they go to their bedroom on the second floor and if they can't walk or they become incapacitated, it's quite difficult for two people to bring anybody uh, down a set of stairs and into an ambulance, so we need additional staff to help uh, with patient care. Many times family members, especially with children, the parents are just as much a patient as the child. Uh, so there's a huge draw on manpower for any medical, so we, we send that help immediately so we're not asking for it later and there's no delay. So if we do that, we're taking bulk of our resources out of the town, nothing left over for anything else. As mentioned, our surrounding communities are not easily relied on like we used to in the past. And uh, so when we ask for help, it's either delayed or we have to go further away to get that help to us. So. It's really just trying to take care of a little bit more of ourselves other than asking for mutual aid, which isn't as reliable as it once was. And um, is the second ambulance currently located in South Acton? It is. Would that be moved to North Acton, or do you still have an issue on medical response time being limited to North Acton possibly? Um, so if we add staff mm -hmm. and we add a new station, uh, that could happen. We would have to take a look at that a little bit more. There's lots of scenarios there that we would be looking at, you know, incident, uh, number of incidents per district. We would, we would have to look at that harder to give you a definite okay. answer, but we certainly could do that. Um, and looking at the map you put up of the town, it's, there aren't as many roads in North Acton, so it's in some ways easy to look at that and think that it's less densely populated, but I know there are also a number of apartment buildings over there. So I think it would be helpful um, for you trying to sell this going forward to put up some sort of population, maybe density based on color gradient or something, so people can see how much of an underserved portion of the community that is. Great idea. Thank you. When I get through the committee, 
Christine. Hey, thank you. <clears throat> you all have been to my home, and I <laughs> truly, <laughs> truly appreciated the fast response and your ability to cart my husband down from our second floor. Perfect. Uh, I, I had some questions, but Christy asked, answered, uh, asked them all, so I really appreciate, uh, really appreciate your time. Jeff. Hi, Chief. Um, I had the same thought that Christy did. Uh, to me, it would be useful to see color code or dots that would show the population distribution in our town. At first, I thought the numbers you showed were how many people served by the station as opposed to the size of the town when that station went in, so it was a little misleading. Um, but that would be helpful, um, especially if you had a color code of the percentages of calls that went to different places, because it does look like it's kind of sparse up there in North Acton. I would also maybe even include the borders around our town, but if you're saying mutual aid is not a, uh, uh, available to us, then perhaps that's not important. But um, in an extreme, if we only had you know, a couple hundred people in North Acton and, Ch and Chelmsford was very dense in that border and had a fire station right at the border, then I'd say, well, why don't we just pay them to handle our couple hundred people and so it would be helpful, I think, to, to show that picture. Um, the other question is, uh, do we get reimbursed by the uh, insurance companies when we go on these ambulance runs with, uh, with people from the town? Yes, we do. So roughly how much does it cost us to run and how much do we charge the uh, insurance company? Is this a profit center? <laughs> it is not a profit center. <laughs> Managing and maintaining an ambulance is quite expensive, especially with the amount of personnel it takes, uh, supplies necessary, and the cost of the vehicle. So it is, not, it is definitely not a profit center. Uh, I'm just trying, you caught me off guard. I wasn't prepared for that. Oh, okay. Um, but, but, no, but, but in, in sense, Jeff, I know that I can tell Jeff. you, I got a bill for $2,000. From who? <laughs> From us, From yes. Oh, and but your insurance company. Yeah, I had a call. So, there, Jeff, there's an ambulance enterprise fund, so it's as close to a profit cost center as we can get with the public sector. So you can dig into the details on that one. Yeah, no, I, but, but I, it, it's kind of important relative to, you know, obviously for-profit ambulances mm -hmm. cost them a lot of money to staff too. So yeah. the formula the insurance companies have is based on all this stuff and maybe not generous in their reimbursement, but it's certainly uh, competitive. And so... Um, when I heard first eight people, and many of them, e you know, EMT or, or higher level, um, I said, oh gosh, that's going to really have a major negative impact in the town, but the income derived from that may mitigate substantially um, what that cost would be. So, again, I always like to be at least two questions ahead of town meeting as to what they might say, and, you know, you, 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 did, you alluded to it, but you didn't specifically say that, by the way, our rating is X in the insurance, national insurance company, and therefore we save on average at every home so many dollars on our fire insurance, home insurance, and that if we, the penalty if we don't comply is this, and if we put in North Acton, we could go to this. So that kind of fiscal um, part would be helpful, as well as the offsetting money that we get from running these ambulances. I'm just trying to help yourself yeah, no, no. or be prepared if, if questions come up and tell me. So, so our ISO rating is four. How that directly correlates to your personal ta uh, insurance bill, I'm not 100% sure of. Um, but we do have an ambulance enterprise fund. We do bill at uh, Medicare plus 210%. So, and not everybody pays. So. Uh, there you go. Bob? And you're thinking about the design of this station. Are you proposing to put any function in there except fire service activity? Well, fire and EMS. As but well. no community meeting house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we would love to have a form of training room which could uh, serve as a said meeting room. Uh, the EOC in the training room at the PSF right now is heavily used and we, we can't always get in there for our training. So 
think it's easily justifiable. Whether or not it's within uh, the scope and the size of the land, we'll, we'll figure that out as we go. The other is not directed to you, but the question of, of not spending the whole amount of money. It would seem to me, Mr. Chairman, that since the article is going to ask for this money, if it wasn't spent, it would go back into uh, free cash yeah. and be available for appropriation for the final uh, for the final product. Rather than, I don't think you can roll it into the final product. No, you can't roll it in. Um, and, and then again, um, this is not a question for you, Chief, but. Mr. Barrett or Mr. McMullen may recall that we got money from Avalon some years ago for a North Acton station. So is there money available to defray any of this um, design cost? Yeah, I, be <clears throat> I believe that Av Avalon's gift was about $500,000. I think presently is about 400000 there. So we can certainly take a look at that. One of the things we also uh, had talked internally is whether we would use a portion of that money to uh, fit up the new facility as well. Obviously, it's going to need new equipment and so on and so forth, and whether that money would be used specifically for that purpose. So uh, we'll be looking into that as well. Okay. Dave, you had another question? Yeah, just a follow-up is, um, and maybe I missed this, but you mentioned the eight additional staffing is, regardless of whether a North Acton fire station would be approved, would you still request eight additional personnel? Uh, yes, so I, I'll bring forward uh, probably in a stage of four, so f like four next year, four the year after. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, if there are no further questions, I thank you very much, Chief. Deputy Chief, Robert, Bob, whatever you can wait. Thank you, sir. Um, I will say that this has been, in the Town Capital Committee, this has been a subject that we've discussed at some length. Um, yeah, the, the additional personnel are going to come sooner or later, one way or another. This is a matter of having redeployment of the personnel, however many there are, uh, so that they're geographically better distributed. And so when I have my heart attack, um, I may survive. Okay. Next on the agenda is Kelly's Corner, and here's Andy. Thank you. I know you had a busy evening already. So I'm Andy Brockway. I'm chair of the steering committee for the Kelly's Corner Improvement Initiative. Um, and so tonight I want to talk to you um, mostly about the infrastructure uh, piece of it. And then I can talk to you also about the zoning to the extent that you, you want to talk about that. Uh, Kristen Guichard, who is the assistant town planner, she was, normally would have been here tonight, but she, she couldn't. So I will try and go through this. Uh, I've, I've sat with Kristen this morning and said I have seen the, the PowerPoint, but I'm not completely intimate with it. Uh, so if there are any questions that I can't answer, then a Christmas can certainly follow up. Uh, so. Um, just briefly, I'm not sure how many people here were uh, on the Finance Committee in April 2016 or a town meeting. So a little over half, all right? So just very quickly in the background, and as many of you know, both formally and informally, people have been concerned about Kelly's Corner for any number of years. There had been some past uh, studies about it. About four years ago, a committee was put together to, and it, the committee was looking at two things in particular. One was sort of revisions to the zoning bylaws, and the other was infrastructure improvements. And the term infrastructure in this case means the roadways, sidewalks, uh, lighting, uh, sort of landscape, and to some extent the actual little utilities. Um, so out of that study in the April 2016 town meeting, there two articles were brought forward. Again, one was about zoning, the other was about infrastructure. The zoning didn't pass. The infrastructure, the article for infrastructure was for uh, funding to do the design. And so that did pass. And so. A little over a year ago, um, the actual design uh, began for the infrastructure piece. Um. <clears throat> 
as anybody's experienced just sort of viscerally without sort of even knowing the numbers, you, it's, it's difficult to get through Kelly's Corner. Uh, regardless of what even the, the volume is, there, there's just sort of very uh, difficult increase in traffic. Um, and so this plan is looking at certainly alleviating some of that, and I can get into some of the details. Uh, I'm gonna skip over a couple of these questions, I'll come back to them because they're just sort of particular questions. Um, uh, and then, actually, if I will, I'll come back to that one too, so I'd, I'd like to get to sort of the timeline here. Uh, so April 2016 town meeting, the residents approved funding for the, the design aspect of it. Uh, the GPI, which is the planning, the consulting engineers, they were hired to do the study. Uh, and it's important to understand that all this work is done under the larger sort of framework of the uh, mass DOT in the Metropolitan Area, Area Planning Council, in that the design and the, uh, or the funding of the project is ultimately coming from uh, state funds and federal funds. And so everything is run through that sort of framework in terms of approval process and standards that have to be met. So um, there's, a, there's a term that you hear a lot called TIP, which is Transportation Improvement Program. And so various communities uh, who have projects look to get uh, onto the so-called TIP which is essentially the, uh, again, the sort of Mass DOT planning, Metropolitan Area Planning Commission approval uh, list. And so back in May 2017, uh, the, the improvement for Coast Corner was officially put on the tip uh, with the intention that initially there'd be nine million in construction funding up and that would fund the construction would start roughly in, in 2022. Uh, there was a public meeting held last year to review some of the very initial plans, and just last week, the 25% design submission was made to Mass DOT, and that's a critical milestone in all this process. So what happens at 25% is now DOT will take that submission, they will have a public hearing this June here to solicit comments, um, and then uh, in a matter of months, I don't know the exact timeline, they will officially uh, sort of give approval to go forward with the completion of the construction documents. In theory, they could, they, at the, in the review process, they could say to change something here and there or go back and think about something here and there, but it's un very unlikely at this point that they would say, you need to go back wholesale and, and redo whatever you're doing. The, the town uh, planning department, as well as the consultants, have been working hand in hand with Mass DOT, so it's not a sort of uh, completely blind submission process. Uh, so, um, about a month from now, I will present here in this room sort of project updates or public uh, town meeting, let people, public workshop to let people know where we're at in the process. And there are going to be two articles uh, for town meeting this April. Uh, they're both dealing with uh, funding. or um, And then, again, in June of this year, there's the Mass TOT design here. Um, <clears throat> assuming that uh, we get approval, we move forward with going to the so-called 75% design. There's sort of vaguely loose terms about what, how far along that really means. Um, ultimately, there's gonna be a town meeting vote for authorization for property acquisitions. Um, and I can get into a little bit more about that in terms of the right of ways are increasing here. And so there will be a series of um, however you want to describe it, negotiations, acquisitions, takings, that will take, that will be part of this project. project. Um, ultimately in April 2019, the design is done, uh, and then uh, out in February 2020 is when the overall design should, design should be complete. Um, 
there are two things here in terms of uh, appraisals, and I got to see if I understand exactly what we have up here. Um, overall, it looks like the design cost would be in the range of 1100000 That's uh, out of the town of Acton's budget. Out of that, um, roughly 756000 I think, has already been approved. Um, the, there will be a cost for appraisals. Some of that is uh, state federal funds. Some of that is town of Acton funds. Uh, and again, there's sort of land acquisitions and that amount will be determined based upon appraisals. And the construction cost has increased as the scope of the project has increased up to 13 and a half million. But it's important to note that that construction cost again is being covered by the state the funding. So it's not coming out of the town, the town's budget. There are some things that within construction might come out of the town's budget like uh, street lamps, and I can talk a little bit about that. So there are two articles for the town meeting. One is for, uh, and these are both require two-thirds of approval. One is for appraisal services. And so because we're getting federal funding, uh, we need to, uh, and we're, they we're dealing with sort of increasing the right of way, we need to follow the federal standards for um, how to go about the appraisal process. And so that includes not just a singular appraisal, but a peer review of that, that appraisal. Um, there is also supplementary engineering design costs, and those go from some uh, additional changes in scope and revisions, and I can, and that's for uh, 344,000, so total of 469,000. Um, again, we've just learned, I think, within the last few days that in this project, there, you know, we're dealing with two ma major intersections, two major streets. One is Mass you know, uh, 111, state controlled. The other is 27. We've just learned that the state will pick up the appraisal cost for um, the state high, so 111. And it, so that has dropped the initial sort of request, or I thought, down to uh, the roughly $100,000. $100, they have um, in here a 25% contingency to get up to 125000 for the request. There are, uh, again, sort of some additional engineering design costs that have been incurred. Um, I think partly, and I don't know the exact numbers, but initially early on in terms of the actual fee proposals, they came in higher than they thought so that their contingency was less uh, starting the project than they had. Um, so specifically, uh, there is another 73,000 or so incurred in additional engineering during this initial 25% design phase. They anticipate another $70,000 to complete the sort of construction documents. And there is a significant, significant contingency in, in here of $200,000. Again, I'll talk a little more about that. Out of that, uh, so out of this uh, 344,000, 61% of that had to do with uh, additional design to, we're gonna realign Charter Road, which is the main road into school, uh, with now with 111. And so they did an, a series of additional design uh, studies and investigations in order to make that happen beyond the original scope. Uh, I won't really go into the plans, but we are getting a light at uh, Charter Road. There's also going to be a light now at Mass Ave, and Community Lane is what's being termed as the cut-through road uh, where Roach Brothers is, and it comes down directly runs into um, CVS. So, right now where everybody's sort of complaining about sort of that intersection, that is now gonna have a light. And origi originally the state did not feel like that warranted a light and there's certain standards you had to meet in terms of uh, traffic count, accidents, a series of sort of metrics. So initially in the design, the state had said no, but they've gone back in conjunction with some of this other uh, redesign to say yes, you should have a light there. 
So that incurred additional assorted design fees. Uh, again, just sort of there's a light down there without going into great detail. Um, the Hosmer House, that is the Acton Historic Society's house. And so part of what happens is the roadways widening is it's impacting their front yard. And so they've been concerned naturally about that. And so we have spent additional time and studies at looking at ways to sort of mitigate uh, the impact on the house. And, and frankly, actually, I think it's trying to find ways to improve its sort of interaction with the public. Again, there have been a series of investigations uh, looking at alternatives. I believe that they are, have actually also hired their own landscape architect to do some quick studies. Um, and, you know, I can't speak for them directly, but they are still concerned about sort of the design. And then there was some uh, additional cost to investigate some, I guess, some various sites here and there, and some minor uh, cost to, to help with the presentation as well as some sidewalk work. Um, so those are sort of the components that are going into the funding request. Um, just in terms of some of the impact, and this is all movements out to 2036. Uh, just to be clear about that, 2036 is sort of the limitation in terms of how far out somebody can reasonably estimate the impact of uh, the improvements. And so the improvements will last longer than that, but they, they can't reasonably estimate it beyond that. So to give you some idea, uh, in the right-hand column, it says, which is really the last sort of design alternative, um, Overall traffic improvements will be about 45% in the morning and 58% in, in the evening. Uh, I forget what that translates into in terms of minutes, and we can sort of translate that back at some point. Um, so that people, you know, it's, it's better to understand it in minutes than sort of percentage. But still, it's a, it's a healthy improvement. Um, so uh, let me see. I can, let me go back to, if you don't mind. Um, I guess these are some questions that were sort of coming up and people were wondering about. So in particular, there's, as some of you may know, there's an ongoing uh, look at the Kmart site in particular about redeveloping that. Uh, and so, in fact, I was at a meeting this morning about that. And so people have this natural question of what happens if you develop that or you develop some other parcels, what's, you know, already traffic's bad, what's in fact going to be by doing that. And so uh, it's, it's important to understand that the infrastructure study that's taking place, design's taking place now, takes into account an estimate of what sort of the maximum impact on those sites would be. So um, there are already considering sort of what sort of redevelopment would, impacts would be. Can we bury the utility poles? Um, it's uh, very expensive. And so uh, estimates were along the line of 1.5 million per mile. <clears throat> and so that would come out of town money, not out of state funding. And so I think it was during the initial sort of conceptual design phase, uh, again, about two and a half years ago, that was discussed. Uh, but we just felt like there wasn't the money there to sort of, for the town to, to pursue that idea. This, this is, uh, again, going back to the sort of studies and the, what was presented at town meeting a couple of years ago, there's, there is some linkage between the zoning and the infrastructure. And, and so the zoning is, you know, again, as I just said, infrastructure is looking at sort of increased capacity within Kelly's Corner. And the zoning is looking at things, so at, for example, reducing the number of curb cuts and sort of trying to increase the street frontage and things like that, which impact traffic. Um, in terms of the sort of sequencing, the infrastructure project is moving along. And so again, we've met that milestone, that important 25% design submission milestone. The, um, the zoning piece of it is we are looking again at coming to a fall town meeting this year with another proposal in terms of revisions for the, the zoning. 
But this time it's going to be with a more particular focus on the Kmart parcel and a particular idea about that. But it's important to remember that whatever zoning takes place there is sort of applied across the board in Kelly's Corner with some sort of, it's dependent upon certain size lots and certain street frontage, but basically there, um, uh, that, that is going forward also. And so, um, I don't know if there's, I think that's probably, probably the basics. Okay, thank you, Andy. Um, questions? I'll start down the other end this time. Bob? On your construction cost of 13 million, you said that that would be done, borne by the state and federal, but earlier you said that we've been approved for 9.9 .9 million, and so what happens to the 2.6 million dollar difference? Other than the state, so we had, a, the estimate initially was for 9 million, I think something along those lines for the construction cost. Uh, the, uh, the, with the increased scope, we're up to, I guess, 13 and a half million. That will be covered by the state on this TIP program. So the state recognizes that the, the scope is increased. And when they approve the project formally at the 25% design level, sometime, let's say, this summer or fall, they will approve it for the 13 and a half million. So that money, that construction cost, will be covered by the state. That difference will be covered by the state, not by the town. Okay, and let's assume when you actually build it, it costs you 16 million. Are they gonna cover that extra $3 million too? In other words, they, yeah, they promise yeah. to pay whatever it costs to build what they approve at the 25% level. Is that what you're saying? It depends, well, they will, they will approve, so for argument's sake, there's a change order for unforeseen conditions because you, there was utilities in a spot that nobody knew and you had to move them. Uh, my understanding is the state would cover that, which is different than a design change that the owner us would in decide. So that we all of a sudden decide we want 20 benches or 20 street lamps that we didn't have before. That that's something that we would occur as, as a cost. Uh, so, um, which reminds me, reminded me though that just I want to be clear about uh, you know. Um, I learned today, for example, that there are street lamps that I guess coming out of this last submission were not covered in the states. They're saying that's not really part of the funding project. And so the cost could be significant. So I think there are two things that we need to do. One is first try and see whether we can get it back in. And two, then change, see what we need to do to change the design to reduce that impact. And so I don't know the numbers yet, but that's, there are some things like that that you know we'll still have to work out, and if the state says yes, it's got to be town funded, then we need to really think about how much we what we can do. Jeff, thank you very much. Um, I have a question about the uh, Department of Transportation study. What were the key factors that say we run out of space to handle cars in 14 years? It's, again, I don't think it's, uh, I don't know the, the ex this was a study put together by the engineers that was submitted to the state. Um, I don't know all the exact details. Again, it's not just for 14 years. I think what, um, that's the limit in which they can sort of predict out on. Um, I, not necessarily in this study, but going back before, I think the issue wasn't so much necessarily the volume of cars, it was the overall traffic, and so those are two different things. And so even when the volume of cars necessarily is going down, so for telecommuting reasons or whatever it was, that traffic and congestion was going up. Uh, and so uh, it's, I'm not an expert on this, but it's not, just because one trend line of volume is going down doesn't necessarily mean that the traffic will sort of correlate in the same direction. Well, the reason I'm asking is, you know, with all the pressure right now on carpooling, you can understand commuting going down possibly, with um, potentially in 14 years, and maybe in my lifetime, cars will be run by computer and be much more efficient and going in and out of places. 
Um, maybe Roche Brothers won't exist because you'll get your groceries delivered by the Amazon person, so you won't go to the Roche Brothers parking lot. Sure. I mean, all these things factor in potentially, and um, I'm just very curious that I, I hope we're not putting in a super highway structure to a deal to address something that perhaps in 15, 20 years won't be an issue. So that's one of well, our Again, I don't know the exact particulars of it, but I think the, they're cognizant of the sort of, sort of change in sort of work environments and change in technology, and so I think at some level they factor that in. Um, but I don't know, again, I don't know the exact particulars. Um, regardless, uh, this design is it's significant, but it's less than what it could have been. So, for example, it's not a four-lane highway going through here to reduce traffic even more. And so there's, uh, and it's not simply about traffic in itself, but it's also, there's an emphasis on trying to make it the more pedestrian-oriented, more uh, bicycly, bicyclist-oriented, um, uh, improve the sort of overall sort of condition of this infrastructure sidewalks um, for lack of a better term, aesthetics in, uh, of Kelly's Corner. So it's not purely a, a, a car traffic sort of idea. Christine. Um, on one of your slides uh, about Community Road, uh, at the bottom it said no left turn onto 111 where that traffic light would go in. Is that, did I read that right? You might have. <laughs> I think that could have, oops, sorry. Yeah, that yeah, last one. Back, back. One, one, one more back. back. One back. Yeah. So no left turn from community lane onto, oh, on to a main, main street. street. The, north part of community. the north part of community lane. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. People shouldn't do that anyway. <laughs> okay. That, that, <laughs> does not bring up the congestion issue I was concerned about the way I had originally read it. So, thank you, I'm good. Christy. Um, you talked about contingency in there, I think you said you'd get back to it. It seemed yeah. like it had a very official meaning that I don't understand, so if you could please yeah. address that. No, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I, there is a significant contingency in there, and I know that's certainly, to me, some question. I think the, what that is for is that when, for example, when the planning department was working on the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail, they ran into some last minute issues on doing environmental studies or something about a variance. And so they're leery of sort of the last minute thing coming up and that they're trying to, at this point, say, as opposed to coming back yet again and yet again looking for money, I think they have a very healthy kind of contingency in here. Um, you know, that's my best understanding of it. Um, certainly, the contingency is bigger than the actual anticipated design costs. So it's well, one of the things coming out of the the mass DOT sort of twenty five percent hearing in June, and then their sort of process is that again, let's say when they finally do the formal seventy five percent approval to move forward, at that point. The unknowns are going to be very few, uh, you know. So you, you, there won't be anything unknown coming from DOT. So they already have all their comments out there. So you, very early on, I would say this fall, we should have a much better handle on what amount of that contingency is really going to be used up. Mike. Well, I guess as Jeff was saying, in 14 years we'll all have flying cars, so we're going to park on the roofs. But <clears throat> my one concern is uh, some of these infrastructure improvements could be taking place today based on our, the town of Acton operating budget uh, if, if they were designed, properly designed already and ready to go, like improving a sidewalk or moving a light and things of that issue. But I guess my main concern is the coordination, and we've seen this conflict before, is, you know, there's a, there's a state road, there's a county road, there's town uh, traffic departments, 
the coordination, like who's the, who's the big capo that's, in, that's going to coordinate all these activities? Because in some cases we've seen the stuff, the, the state make changes to the traffic light on 27 and 111 without, without anyone <coughs> being made aware of that they were making changes and, you know, things of that issue that uh, because there's so many different uh, government, governmental bureaucracies in the transportation department involved that uh, who, who's going to be the ultimate authority to uh, manage this process? Well, I think there are two things. One would be this, the state certainly is a major player because, you know, it's 111. I would, going back though, that, you know, they've already seen, they will have seen the design, the approved design all along. Um, then beyond that, there's obviously the town and, you know, the town's consultant and town's, you know, if there's an owner's representative on the project, I don't know. But, I mean, that's, um, there's, I, I mean, it's an interaction with the state as far as I know. I don't know any other sort of agency, mass DOT for the most part. There will have been some sort of environmental studies done already, uh, you know, so that won't be ongoing when, when the construction actually starts. Jason. On the slide where you talk about how much this is going to cost, uh, there appear to be two blank lines on the land taking and land acquisition. Yeah. Do you have any ballpark on what that's going to cost and what the, you know, what exactly are we taking? Are we just taking the eight feet on each side? Are we taking all of community lane? Are we going to put Buena We Santa out of business? What all exactly are the costs going to be and what are you ballparking them to be at? All right, so there's a range of acquisitions, again, for lack of a better word, but um, that they go from taking two feet to more important or more larger impacts of, for example, Buena Masano uh, and or community lane. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the number. It's one thing I was asking Kristen about is trying to get at least the number to give you an idea of the number of parcels affected and sort of the range. Um, and we can get you that, at least that information. I know they're very leery about sort of giving a number, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I happened to do the appraisals. Um, but, you know, it's, again, it's not an insignificant number, you know. So I'm hesitant to say anything because I don't know exactly what it is either. And so. Furthermore, if we end up not building out Kelly's Corner to the absolute max proposed Casey's, uh, Kelly's Corner zone that you're talking about, would that have um, ramifications on perhaps we didn't need to take quite as much on each side of the road, on each side of the road, if we're not going to be building out for the maximum number of residents that were being, that are being called for in this uh, fall 2018 special town meeting. So is it not possible that we can be overbuilding at this time without actually having a plan for what we're going to put into that space? No, I, I, I don't really see that as being the case. I mean, one of the things is yeah, we have to meet, um, I, you know, again, I don't have the exact numbers on me, but the number, the impact of, for example, a development at Kelly's Corner, I think, is far less than what, in general, people would anticipate in terms of uh, traffic flow, et cetera. Overall, most of the traffic is coming from out of town. And so things that we can't control about. So people coming off of Route 2 and going to Maynard, for example. Um, and so that's where a significant impact. The people coming down from Boxborough getting on Route 2, vice versa. And so the development within literally Kelly's Corner doesn't have as nearly as much of an impact as that, that piece of it. Uh, so the other thing is we, regardless, we have to meet certain standards uh, for DOT in order to get approved. So that would include, for example, having in this case, a complete streets policy with uh, bike lanes and, uh, you know, certain, we need to have a certain number of turning lanes in order to handle uh, whatever capacity is coming out of already, for example, coming down 111. So I'm, I don't really see the zoning one way or another fundamentally altering the capacity issue. And lastly, you mentioned that there's two separate articles that we're going to be addressing during this town meeting. Yeah. I only see uh, one listed in the draft warrant article. 
draft, draft the warrant. All right, well, Brian, 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 there's only going to be one. I could be mistaken, but it's. No, I, th I, th I thought there were two. <laughs> Yeah, I think originally what, what happened is there was two two different funding so, or two different components of the funding that we needed. It, one was for the appraisal services, which is now low. It was originally four hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and then the supplemental engineering of three forty four. If you look at Article Nine um, on this worksheet attached to your agenda, um, Article Nine is for seven hundred and ninety four thousand dollars. We believe that number now is 469,000 because the state is paying for some of those appraisal services. And we just found that out, I think, today. Yeah. So, so but it is in one article. It's two components, but one article right yeah. now. Thank you. Sorry, just to also be clear about what the appraisal, what we're asking for, for the appraisal piece of it is not, this is not approval to take property. This is simply funding to do the appraisals. And I think it's next town meeting, so April 2019, is when we'd come back and ask for the Board of Selectmen to have the authority to go ahead with that process. And part of that has to do with uh, you cannot enter into negotiations with the property owners, the affected property owners until the design is at roughly the 75% phase, and this is go governed by federal standards. Okay, I, I just want just two quick comments. One, um, I understand you can't enter into negotiations, but you, there has to be some ability to ballpark it. Otherwise, you're walking into town meeting saying we want to spend half a million dollars in design fundings and God knows what the land taking number is going to be. Is it two million? Is it eight million? Is it 20 million? There has to be a ballpark, otherwise you're asking for a blank check, which I don't recommend you do. And then secondly, uh, not necessarily for your ears, because I know that uh, this is not uh, something that you, that this is something you say you sh can't be done. Um, as for bearing the utilities until you, until you mandate it and demand it, they can say it'll cost wherever they want to say it'll cost. Until you make it a mandatory thing, if you rip up our roads, you have to bury the utilities. I think you might find that the mentality changes. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Just to to whom when when you're saying that to to, to the board of selectmen, to oh. you, to whoever else uh, has been, whether it's the land use department, whoever else is is has any bearing on this, uh, until you if you just take it on faith that it's going to be one and a half million dollars per mile. Yeah. Do we have no leverage in this at all? Are we willing to just walk away from it forever? I. I I don't think it's a good idea. I think the sooner we start to harden the town, the better off we'll be in the longer term. And continuing to kick it down the, down the road is a bad idea. If you're already ripping up the streets, fix it now. Oh, John, Dave. I just have one question. Um, I was at, in the 2016 town meeting, do we itemize these uh, these potential expenses as far as the, the the infrastructure plan? There were two things that were itemized in the design. One was to reach this 25% submission level, and then the other was to go from there to the final complete 100% design. Overall, I think those were 756,000. So are these numbers captured in that number, I guess? Is, is so these are additional funds, these are requests for additional funding above and beyond that number for the design piece of it. Yeah, it's just a little concerning because I think we want to be clear with the town that, you know, if we could, at the time I remember thinking, oh, the infrastructure plan looks really great because of the, you know, 9 million or 13 million or whatever the number is in the state, you know, kicking in the, the majority, if not all of that. But now if there's additional costs, it does, seem a little bit like, you know, bleeding into just extra and extra. And then if we're going to come back in town meeting in 2019 and request more money, it might be a question of, well, what else is there? What else is there? And it's just sort of that drip, drip, drip of, and it's not drip, drip, drip. In this case, it's, you know, whatever the updated numbers are, you know, 300,000, 500,000 or whatever it is, but it does start to get to be substantial. Yes. <clears throat> Tom. Jason had asked my uh, for primary question, which was on the land acquisition cost, because you can imagine they could be quite substantial. Uh, do we at least have a, or do we know what the share might be between the state and the town? 
on those costs? Uh, I don't. I mean, and, and, and apparently, from what, what I know informally at least, that Bueno Asano, whatever happens there, would be picked up by the state. That's what I heard today informally. So that could have, that certainly, if you were to think about the components of what could be in there besides community lane, that was a parcel that was significantly affected. So, so that is good news at, at the very least. Um, one thing I think we can do when you know, Kristen gets back is to trying to get you that answer at least say, okay, these are the number of parcels that are now, I know she has it in a spreadsheet. So these are the number of parcels that are in 111. These are, you know, by state. These are the parcels that the town is responsible for. These are sort of the relative scale of this parcel versus that parcel. Um, community lane, for example, it would be presumably in the town. You don't know where that's going to go. That could be simply a negotiation with Edens, who owns Roach. They're the ones who own the whole Roach Brothers Plaza, Edens Development. That could be, in, you know, ideally very little, as a certain nice trade-off. It could be that they they want, for whatever reasons, for tax reasons, whatever, a different number. Um, I I. Agree generally agree with the idea about trying to give people a spectrum of the number. I th one thing we've, you know, we got to be careful about is that we don't get caught too badly, though, by somebody coming up later and saying, you said this, and when it was going to be, you know, when we haven't done the appraisal, so how do we really know what the number is? And then a second one, to the Kmart property specifically, just sequencing, you know, the, I don't know how much, how impacted that may be by this project, but with the redevelopment coming on, we wouldn't want them getting too far ahead and then finding out that we needed to do something and, and along those lines, right? Okay. So is there, do we have the sequencing now? So there, there's a, so just on the Kmart site, uh, to give you a little bit of overview on that. Um, so the Kmart site's owned by Stop and Shop. Uh, Kmart has a lease. They've had a lease for a long time. It is going to be up in 2021, I believe. I think that's the year. Stop and Shop is not going to renew the lease. So, so regardless of you know, whatever scenario, Kmart will not have the lease renewed in, at that point. Kmart's owned by Sears. Sears is in significant trouble. So we don't know whether Sears is going to go bankrupt before 2021 or not. Uh, so it's possible that that site, you know, through negotiation could be available earlier than 2021. Um, Kmart has a preferred developer they've worked with, Win Stanley Enterprises. They're out of Concord. They've done work in Chelmsford. Um, they are now working with Stop and Shop, and they've been working with, they've met with the Kelly's Corner Steering Committee several times, and they've met We've met as a group with some representatives from various town committees about very initially some ideas they have. Um, that group, they have their own engineers. And so those engineers have been in contact with the town's engineers in terms of the infrastructure plan. And they've been back and forth. So there's been, even though they're in a very, the Kmart site's in a very initial concept stage, they've had discussions with the infrastructure engineers about what could you do, where could we have the, the entrance into the site, things like that. So um, that effort is sort of ongoing. They will have a, an initial, again, this is the Kmart, Win Stanley sort of proposal. They, in April 25th, I think, is what we're going to do, is we're going to have an initial sort of workshop, public workshop, about the Kmart site. And then they'll have probably two more uh, general workshops and they'll try and go to town meeting, well, I forget whether we're at the fall town meeting, you know, October, whenever it is exactly, with revisions to the zoning. Um, it's important to remember though that zoning, again, is gonna apply not just to this site, but to sort of overall the Kelly's Corner. I guess my concern is just that whatever plans they ultimately come up with for development there, and it sounds like it could be substantial, aren't in conflict with, it, with whatever the town wants to do with the redevelopment of Kelly's Corner. 
No, it's not, and if anything, I think the, the town's first, you know, so, so I think the town at some level says, you know, you know, you got to move your, one of, one of the things about any development on Kmart site, again, is because it's given its size and given its street frontage, it's allowed to enter into what will be a master planning process, and so that's, um, which doesn't exist now, but would exist under the zoning revisions. So at that point, also the town has much greater control over sort of the design on the site. Uh, and so issues like where the entrance might be, what aesthetically it might look like, things like that, uh, the town can have much more input and say on. Um. <laughs> can you be brief? <laughs> okay. Um, I recall that when we bought a parcel of CPA funds, the issue was you cannot pay the owner more than the assessed value of the property. And they had to raise some other money to, to buy it. Is there any tie-in between the assessed value and the taking? In other words, could an appraiser come in for something that the whole square footage is assessed at half a million and we're taking a quarter of the property and, and say it's worth two million? Or are there controls or limits as to what the assessor can do. Appraiser, sorry. Uh, I, again, I don't know the particulars. Whatever they do has to follow federal guidelines in terms of the appraisal process. Um, I, I don't know beyond that really the, the well, answer to your question. What would likely happen, <coughs> Jeff, is um, there'd be an appraiser working for the state or the town. Uh, the property owner would also have an appraiser they hire. Uh, and there'd probably eventually be a third appraisal done to reconcile uh, any differences. But, but assess, assessment's not going to have much to do with it, if anything. I was just hoping that uh, Jason would have at least as a limit of 11 times whatever the average assessment was. Appraised, you know, the town. And, but yeah. It sounds like, oh, you know, they pay half a million, uh, based on half a million, but they want 10 million for the property. Yeah, a triple yeah. question. There, okay. There's just one thing quickly also on appraisals that, you know, if they can't come to some agreement on it, it doesn't slow the project down. So they can't stop the project. Uh, so uh, that's important to remember. So, Andy, the, I think you definitely need to um, be able to ballpark land takings. Uh, you know, if, you're going, if you're going to go to town meeting with this and talk appraisals, then somebody's going to ask the question, well, how much money are we talking about? And, and yeah, well, the state may pay for stuff, but people in town meeting don't care about what the state pays for. They care about what they're going to have to pay for. So you really need to, to have a, a range of estimates. I think the other thing you need to do is to, to be able to say that whatever you're doing here in terms of infrastructure changes, is going to work no matter what happens to Kmart. That you, you know, maybe it's going to be a mixed-use residential, commercial. Maybe it's going to be a um, affordable housing lot. Maybe it's going to be an Ocean State job lot in the same footprint. But you ha I think you have to sit, tell people you're not wasting their time and their money with this infrastructure plan. That whatever happens in. Um, in the Kmart parcel, this if, this would still be a good investment. Yeah. And with that, I thank you for your time. All right, thank you. All right, moving on to the ALG report. Um, ALG actually met twice since we've met. Uh, we met on the first, and we met on the eighth. Um, the, um, I guess I'll cut right to the, the chase on this. The um, page two in the packet you found at your place basically is a um, outline of the consensus plan that was reached and comparing it to the recommendations we had in our point of view. Um, now, ALG reached a consensus based on FY19 only. Uh, FY20 and 21 on the plan are still up for discussion and will be discussed um, at the next ALG meeting. So, um, currently, um, 
we said the operating budget should go no more than 3%. Um, and the town is coming in at 2.5% and the school district at 3.0%. They had, they cut roughly $240,000 uh, cut or found, however you want to put it, uh, money. Yes, Carolyn. So what does that rate work out to be total then? So if you had a 2.5 and a 3, Roughly about Let me do that in my head. Uh, about 2.75. The, the, the school is about two, two thirds, and the two town nine, is one third. So. so we're under that recommendation. We said that the operating budget should only use one third of the current unused tax levy capacity, and uh, that has been complied with. There's three hundred four thousand dollars in untaxed levy capacity in the consensus plan. That both the town and the school district should maintain their funding levels for OPEB. They have done that. Um, they've also both increased their um, capital uh, budgets. Um, and that uh, in terms of reserves, uh, we still fit within the, um, the reserve guidelines, uh, encourage the use of reserves for capital one-time items. So the way it works is the Schools came down by 240,000. Uh, there was, of course, the, the reduction in health care costs of 5%, but affected both the towns and the schools. Um, so in terms of reserves, the way we balanced the budget was um, to come up with a planned use of basically 2,385,000 and essentially the plan replenishment, as you know, is $2 million, so the net reserve use that we we're talking about, um, we tagged to specific capital items, uh, 189000 uh, on Minuteman's building project, uh, the MBTA train whistle ban of 140000 the bike share program of 9000 in the interest uh, on the fire engine of uh, 23000 almost 24, the fire station HVACs and um, the Complete Streets program to um, get us to um, 2,385, I think it's 217, it's a typo. Steve, and, can you just help me with that arithmetic coming down? I couldn't quite follow what's being added and subtracted. I mean, I see all the numbers, but how do you get from 2,385 to 2,385 with all that? So, um, Essentially, what we, the way the ALG plan works is we uh, assume that, based on history, roughly $2 million in our reserve use will get replenished. So when we say we're going to use, now we're going to say we're going to use $2 million what we're talking about is a net use of 385000 And for us, um, the way Jason and I put it, it, it needs to be tagged to specific capital items and not um, operating expenses. So we made a list of uh, the capital items um, that um, we wanted to see uh, specified as this is what we're using the $385,000 on this year. So then what I'm listing there is the capital projects. Some of them are what's currently in the budget. The Minuteman is a, is a piece of their assessment for their building project. Um, the train whistle is, a, a, is an item on the town's capital budget, uh, as is the bike share program. And the others are first year interest on potential bonding uh, for the fire station, the HVACs fire engine, the HVAC and the fire stations and the complete streets program. So that's basically how we cut up the 385,000. Yes, Jeff. Given that we're going to be using um, some untaxed levy and the fact the school went up 3%, but our levy, our ex charge from the school is going up 4 or 5%, um, what is the it'll be, actual? It'll be 3.9. 3.9? No, no. Yeah, after this it will be 3.9, the assessment. The, the asset, so neutral to the expansion of all that, the actual, the average tax bill will go up 3.9%? 3.63. Pardon me? 3.63. Thank you. 
if you, page four is the ALG plan as if we adopt this consensus. Um, so you can see the reserves are moved up. Um, the um, to two million three eighty five. The um, increase in municipal spending is two point five four. The increase in the AB assessment um, is three point nine. So we come up roughly in balance. A slight surplus of two million four eighty five. The other things I list is, is our recommendations and the point of view really weren't ALG. I mean, we made the points about capital, we made the points about um, a lot of these things, but they weren't uh, within the scope of the ALG discussion. So, um, well, Jason, do you want anything? Uh, just briefly, that uh, the one point that I, that I uh, would like to continue to make is a very strong case can be made that uh, we talk about having reserves, but if you're taking the overarching picture of the town, if you've got uh, $26 million in capital deficiencies on the municipal side and $120 million of capital deficiencies on the school side, if you even just boil that down to what we're actually willing to pay uh, to fix those capital deficiencies, that more than, more than obliterates our reserves. So I would just, I, I think it's, perhaps I'm being overly cautious, but I do feel that uh, saying we have reserves when we have this level of liability is, um, is something I would counter with on a regular basis. But yes, I supported the consensus ALG budget. So um, in a moment, we're gonna ask you to vote to ratify what we did. Um, it's important to note that you are not necessarily vote, agreeing to vote for all these items. Um, you still have the right to vote however you feel. You want to vote on a fire engine or a bike share program. What we're asking for is a, is a, uh, a vote to ratify the consensus that Jason and I reached at ALG uh, because we uh, will go forward to town meeting with what we consider to be a balanced budget. Uh, you are not, like I said, you're not binding yourself to vote in favor of any particular item or budget by doing so. Christine. At the last school committee meeting when they presented the state of their budget and um, found monies, they were not yet down to 3%. Did they find more savings in between your last two ALG meetings? Um, don't... Uh, I don't attend school committee meetings, so uh, there was the health care dropped the budget, the, the budget quite a bit, and then um, after that it was $240,000 of, help me out, Jason, early retirement. <laughs> Same, Two know. things in early retirement, $100,000 in a, a greater reimbursement for, uh, for regional transportation, and there was one other thing. Uh, the things that you, the things that you recorded on, at the last school committee, are, do indeed bring down the overall assessment to 3.04 percent year over year increase. So um, the two hundred and forty thousand dollars that uh, that was brought up at that last school committee results in two hundred and four thousand dollars in Acton dollars for the assessment. So the school operating budget is now going up 3.04. The act-in assessment is going up 3.9% as a result of the Appendix A. So we get to the bottom line. Yes. My only concern is the way they cut, will that put in jeopardy turn back at the end of the year? Quite possibly. A, but, you know, as opposed to cutting real expenses Cutting estimates, does that, you know, that's my big concern. Um, Wait. I'm not quite sure um, what the impact on uh, turnbacks will be. Um, 
Turnbacks tend to be a function of operating. On the school side, turnbacks tend to be a function of operating expenses as opposed to revenue. Um, on the town side, it's, it's the other way around. Um, at this point, um, I've been through ALGs quite a few times. There are, no, there are no style points given for how you arrive at a consensus. Um, the object is to get there. Um, and um, as far as this, this particular consensus, this is as close as we've ever come to getting our point of view into the consent. It is the only time we've ever gotten the incomplete point of view into the final budget. Yes. If it makes you feel any better, Jeff, that uh, $2 million planned replenishment is, was agreed to by the other entities. So the expectation is that, that the, uh, the turnbacks, the $2 million turnbacks will occur. Whether or not it puts it into jeopardy, TBD. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Dave. Yeah, just the, um, so when you say town operating budget, limited to 3%, where, where, what, is, what is that inclusive of? I know this is, a, I should know this answer, but I'm just asking for a refresher <laughs> for the new members. If, in terms of the ALJ sheet, the town operating budget would also include their um, subsidies and, and, and things like that. So it's not just the, um, the 26 liner. Okay, so it's, it's obviously related to the multi-year financial model, but not that. Well, when the, the town operating budget will be given to town meeting in several pieces. Yeah, right. Well, town operating budget is capital piece, but this is an all-inclusive uh, number. I think another way to look at it is it's absolutely everything that comes out of your tax bill with the exception of the school district and the Minuteman assessment. Christy. Uh, we had say in here that these reserve use is, as I understand it, for these capital projects. They're not specifically earmarked that the money is only used for these things, right? It's just the what we're using to justify having used reserves within our guidelines of wanting to use it for capital projects, not just yes. operating. And one, there's no one, one of these projects could fail a town meeting for that matter, you know, so. And there's no way to do something similar on the school side, right? Right. They just give us, we need this number, and we can't say, okay, well, we think you should do this roof project and that other thing. Um, the difference between the way the schools present a town meeting and the way the town does is the town breaks out articles, capital articles, bonding articles. The schools just give us an assessment. Okay. Bob. If articles 13 through 16, so small it's hard to read, 13 through 16 were actually had money in them and were approved, it would be equivalent to raising the 2.54% to some a higher number uh, unknown unless you knew what numbers were in those articles. Is that correct? No, it would depend on how they fund them, but yes. <laughs> they potentially could fund them on our reserves. But, um, okay, with that, I'll entertain a motion to um, ratify the ALG consensus for F-119. So moved. Is there a second? second? Okay, been moved and seconded. Any other discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, thank you. We will um, get to work on FY20 and 21. Um, pretty well get the, AL, uh, the FinCom long-range model um, fired up and ready to go. Um, so probably in between our meetings, I'll be sending out a sh assumptions sheet so they can all weigh in on, on the assumptions, and then um, we can take a look at that at one of our next two meetings. Um, actually, it'll have to be the next meeting. 
because ALG meets the day after, and we want to make sure we get our input into what those two years look like on the ALG plan. Okay, uh, sheet number five is a quick update on OPEB for the people that didn't read the entire report that Steve Barrett sent out today. Um, and I guess let me start by saying it's other post-employment benefits and what we're really talking about is the fact that um, I believe it is chapter 32, Bob, um, which we have been adopted years ago. Um, both the town and the school district um, pay um, health insurance benefits for retirees. Um, up to age 65, they basically pay um, half of the uh, uh, going rate, and once the uh, employee reaches the age 65, they have to go on to Medicare, and then they pay half of the, the Medicare rate. So, um, what um, what you're looking at is a comparison of the last set of numbers, which are these are actuarial studies that are done every two years, uh, December 31st, 2016 versus. Um, December 31st, 2014. Um, the uh, unfunded actuarial, know, actuarial accrued liability um, has come down for the town by three mil three and a half million dollars, roughly, or 21 percent. Um, slight increase uh, for the schools. Uh, 1.8 million or 4 percent um, over, it kind of works out to a 3 percent uh, decline. Um, we don't worry too much about the, that number. Um, the normal cost, which is, it represents a, the cost of providing health care in the future for your current employees, as opposed to the cost of paying for the retirees. Um, and in that case, um, the Towns is down um, significantly, 41 percent. Um, the Schools is also down significantly, 38 percent. Now, why does that happen? That happens because there's been significant health care uh, redesign, uh, and this actually doesn't even factor in the last um, changes to the health insurance plans, the, the increase in uh, co-pays and deductibles. Um, and the ARC, which is the annual uh, required contribution, um, which is again another misnomer, is not required, um, has come down for the town by 28 percent in the schools. Um, seven percent. So back in, in, in the day um, when we had an active OPEB committee, uh, we pretty much said that our long-term goal was to fund the normal cost um, because that was indeed the piece that wasn't being funded. The, the retiree health care was being paid on an ongoing basis every year anyway. What we weren't putting aside was anything for the people that hadn't retired yet. So the last uh, tier shows that the town is uh, currently doing 220% of the normal cost, and that's up from 147% uh, in FY14. Schools are currently doing about 55% of the normal cost, uh, which is more than double what they were doing in FY14. So. Uh, both entities have made tremendous strides. Um, the, um, the town basically is on a track to extinguish their OPEB liability relatively. I mean, these are things you measure in like 30 years at a time, but they will get that done. Um, and the schools are, are improving. The, um, not to be overly morbid, but the theory we had was that the, the current retirees 
that are being paid out of the annual budgets will all eventually die off. <laughs> what you had to worry about was the people who were currently working for you. Um, so the schools have made a, a jump on that. Clearly the schools have many, many more employees than the town. Steve, yes. for the bottom line, is my guess would be if you were doing something less than 100%, you'd actually be worsening your shortfall, not improving it. Is that not right? Um, the world of OPEB is full of actuaries and assumptions on assumptions on assumptions. Um, probably this, the schools at doing 55% of the normal cost is probably one of the best numbers in the state. Um, and um, what happens is the assumptions change. Investment performance becomes part of the, the mix. Uh, when we first started looking at this, you know, it's like back in 2008 or whatever, investment performance was negative, <laughs> healthcare inflation was going through the roof, and then these numbers were in the hundreds of millions. <laughs> you know, now they're almost manageable. Um, so um, the actuaries that um, compute this stuff will always say, yeah, well, you should be funding it fully. There's no requirement that you fund it fully, um, and that, may, that day may come. Uh, what it does do is, to the extent you don't fund at least the normal cost, um, the liability on your balance sheet increases. So um, that's not going to happen with the town anymore. It'll still happen uh, with the schools until they, they get their funding up. I think a couple years ago we kind of pinned it at about 1.4 million or something like that. They're, they're roughly at a million, 900 to a million now. So they're, as long as they keep them uh, on the track, um, they should um, get to be in pretty decent shape. Questions on the OPEB update? Um, I can send you the uh, school's report. It's it's not as big. <laughs> Different actuaries. Steve, um, which of the um, employees are required to go into Medicare at sixty-five? Is that the school side? All, the all of them, I believe. So the schools have to. So all. all long-time teachers are eligible to go into Medicare, is that correct? No, that's two different questions. If you're eligible for Medicare, you have to go. If you're not eligible for Medicare, we pay. We pay, we pay half. Yeah. No, yes, we would, pay, we would pay half of, so there are some employees of the town who were never eligible for Medicare, and we basically pay half. So there's just as, there Normal employees would get, I think it's 75%, they would get 50% paid. Uh, but the number goes down, and, and I think most of, the, most of the current teachers are all, there are payments made to Medicare, so they will be Medicare eligible. Some of the older teachers, I'm not sure exactly where they, okay. where they stand. Uh, and uh, some, sometimes people who were not, who retired from either the schools or the town who are not eligible for Medicare, we're only a few quarters short, and in their retirement, they made up the quarters so they could get on to Medicare. Because if you only take Medicare and do not take a supplement, then there's no contribution on your part or on the town's part. Right. Our 50% contribution is when they have a Medicare supplement or when they take a Medicare Advantage plan, and the 50% is the yeah. minimum under 32B. I understand. Thank you. Well. I guess while you have the floor, Bob, I should um, point out that Bob has decided um, not to uh, seek reappointment uh, to the Finance Committee um, after this term expires in, in May. Um, personally, I'm distraught by this for a couple of reasons. Uh, I will then be the senior member on this committee. <laughs> uh, 
I may not be the oldest. <laughs> uh, but Bob held those both titles with distinction for many years. Uh, is there anything you want to address to the committee while you have the floor, sir? No, I would, uh, since we've been talking about health insurance for the last number of years, I've been the finance committee member on the health insurance trust and have been, in fact, the chair for a long time. Uh, one of you will have to take this particular position. Uh, it's really a great, uh, a fun committee to be on. Uh, the people are nice, the workload is not excessively heavy, and uh, the, is the issues, in fact, are, 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 in are very interesting. Um, apart from that, um, it's been a pleasure working with all of, of you people, and it will continue to be for the next few, few months. Uh, there are a number of people who preceded you on the committee for whom it was also a pleasure to, uh, to work, and uh, it's uh, been an enjoyable part of life, and I will obviously uh, miss it and all of you. Thank you, Bob. Um, okay, one well, more applause. <laughs> Okay, so um, we also have to deal with warrant assignments. I have been promised to draft warrant at our next meeting. Um, and um, so what, what happens from here is um, when we have a draft warrant, we will start going through um, articles to the extent they're final. Uh, and we will vote on them. So a lot of votes will happen next time, and whatever votes don't happen next time will happen on March 13th. Uh, the deadline to get um, recommendations into the printer warrant will, will be basically our last opportunity to be our March 13th meeting. So um, I am not one to defer on an article. That's not why the town pays us. Oh, wait a minute, they don't pay us, do they? But it's not our job not to defer. <laughs> uh, so we will, uh, the next couple of meetings could be long. With that, um, well, I guess, Bob, I'll give you your first choice then. Is there any particular article on this list that you want <laughs> as an assignment? <laughs> no, I will say to you what I've said to previous chairman, I'll take whatever article you want me to take. Okay. Well then, the last thing you have in your place is, as Bob pointed out, the very small print of the list of articles. Um, we'll s so let's do the obvious ones. Jason, are you taking the school district assessment? Yes, sir. Okay. And Roland, community preservation? Mike, are you doing Minute Man? Sure. Okay, so much for the easy ones. Um, town operating budget, who would like that? It's overwhelming. Dave, that's yours. <laughs> That'll get you to walk out. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, So Article 8 is um, the fire station, uh, complete streets, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff in there, um, but not Kelly's Corner, okay. Um, any volunteers? Okay. Kelly's Corner Engineering and Appraisal Services. Okay. Capital Equipment and Infrastructure Non Bonding. So this would be the MBTA whistle stop and the bike share.
Okay, um, 11 and 12 are placeholders. <laughs> it's the little school building. <laughs> okay, again, um, 13, 14, 15, and 16 are potential collective bargaining agreements. Do we believe that's really going to happen? No, uh, Jeff hasn't gotten an assignment yet. Okay, Jeff, you get all of those. They're unlikely to happen. But. It's a collective bargaining. <laughs> down to 17 commuter lot maintenance now these are consents well who doesn't have anything yet why don't the two of you split them up yeah 17 and 25 Let me know which one of you is taking which. Placeholder for second night first article. <laughs> oh, I guess I'll take that one. <laughs> take the mystery box. Yeah. Um, transfer of real property, Knox Trail. Do we know what it is, Brian? I think it's a sliver of land between Knox Trail and the Acibet River. Um, I believe right now, I think we're in the process of foreclosing on that. So again, I'm not sure if that's gonna be uh, in time for town meeting, but it's kind of there as a placeholder. So okay. we're getting close. And Fort Cherry Ridge, what's that? Yeah, Fort Cherry Ridge, we did last year as well. Oh, no, um, not again. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's back. <laughs> It's a different proposal because it's not affordable housing. There's a developer who wants to build a house for a veteran, and so it may be market rate or affordable, whatever, but there is somebody who wants to build one house, and I hope I don't get stuck presenting, so. Well, I'd say you have some uh, influence over it this year. <laughs> right. Did, Roland, you had it last year, you want it this year? Yeah. Oh, sure. Men, town bylaws, demolition delay. Hmm. Um, yeah, we should take that one. It's going to be the historic commission, if I'm thinking correctly. I can do them. Dog tickets? You got that one, Mike. Tree warden appointment. <laughs> We're about to. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff, you you just got that one. <laughs> <laughs> You're sitting too close to it. <laughs> Dean, Dean Charlie used to be our tree warden. Yeah. All right, Christine, you can get. Um, 32 then. Okay, Brian, these land acquisitions on consent. Just sidewalk stuff. Yeah, Taylor Road might be um, a 
was a little tricky. I think it's for a signed up walk easement, but instead of just doing an easement, I think we're doing a, a land swap there, I think. Yeah, but that's, that's, I don't, it's, it's pretty much all I know really on those. Okay, John, why don't you take all three of those? <laughs> Yeah, they're all on consent. It sounds like a job for an attorney. <laughs> okay. Who feels they can do more work? Though none of the remaining ones require much work. Okay, then we'll go all through it. 36 is Tom, 37, Christy, 38, Tom, 39, Christy, 40 is Tom, 41 is Christy. None of those ever come up, actually, but. All right, um, this list is, Still in flux, and so will change. Some will, some will drop off. Some will come on before we're done. Um, so, as the way the next few meetings will play out, we'll have a uh, budget hearing, uh, which is a formality, but we must have it uh, next time. We will then hear from the community preservation. Uh, committee, uh, and then whatever your pleasure is, we can ask for uh, another presentation from the schools in the town on their budgets if you have more questions, um, or then we can, if not, we can go straight into um, deliberation. Um, so what are you thinking in terms of um, more presentations. Well, let's go. First, do you want to bring the schools back in? Uh, yes. I still have questions about the maintenance that they failed to address. Um, is that the sort of thing we should bring them back in for, or should I just get in touch with them separately? If it's just you, then I'd say get in touch with them separately. If there's more people that have other questions, then we'll bring them back in. From what I can see, they have um, completely failed to do work on the immediate health and safety requirements addressed by um, that Durham Whittier recommended in the one to two year range. They had said they would tell us more about it in this budget presentation, and they did not, from what I can tell. So I can. Okay. Then I can address them more directly through email or. <laughs> then we'll, we'll get an invitation to come back. Okay. Okay, the town. Um, and this would include not just the town operating budget, but anything having to do with Kelly's Corner or any of the capital projects. Um, I guess I would say that we should have them back just in case one of those things that are placeholders comes, becomes live because we would not have heard from anybody about them, so. But, Mr. Chairman, are we going to actually hear what the zoning proposal is? I mean, it's one thing to say we're going to re redesign the Kmart parking lot, but are we going to put six-story buildings in it or, or three, three deep mines? I mean, how, how do we, how can we take a position on anything? This, this, this is a chicken and egg situation, but since John's our liaison on Kelly's Corner, I'll let him ask. Um, the, the Kelly's Corner zoning um, will come up in a special town meeting in the fall, either October or November. That would include a presentation of what the developer's intentions would be with respect to the parcel. And, and, they're, and they're getting going on That'll pick up after after town meeting with a series of information sessions. And um, we'll also at our next meeting go over um, the FY20 and 21 numbers um, from the ALG plan. 
Um, on March 13th, um, whatever articles we have not come to a vote on, uh, we will vote on. Um, and um, at that time, I would hope that we will have, I will have drafted a warrant message um, that we can review. Um, hopefully, it'll be out before that meeting because any changes you make would have to be done after the meeting because the deadline will be the next day. <laughs> All right. Committee reports. Roland. So CPC has been meeting and going over their proposals or their requests for money. And one of the, the town is an applicant on the Kennedy building, which is the building at the cemetery. And to redo that, and there's different aspects of that, but part of it, which is has some consternation with the CPC is one, they say it's a historic building, the building is only 50 years old. So the building's younger than I am, so if that's historic, <laughs> I must be, and most of us here. Um, part of the proposal was that they want $15,000 for furniture, which doesn't fall within CPC guidelines of being eligible. So they're dealing with that. Um, there is one point. One million five hundred fifty-six thousand in the open space set aside, less eighty-five thousand dollars be drawn out for the debt on the right hill property, and then whatever the replenishment they're going to go for for this year. Um, one of them that was pulled was the acquiring of that property on Harris, which was right next to 62 Harris, right next to the fire station to restore the old schoolhouse building. Well, there's a PNS on that building. There is a PNS signed PNS on that property right now. So Peter Barry says, well, we can just go maybe reach out to the, the person who's going to buy it and see if he'll flip it to us and give him an additional $30,000, which kind of makes me a little angry as a taxpayer that we are going to buy a property for more than was just sold for and flip the owner $30,000. Well, it seems like at the town when they came to the CPC to have this project funded, they didn't do their due diligence in a way, saying, well, there's a PNS on the property, but it's not going to go through. Well, obviously, probably what happened is the guy who was going to have the PNS was thinking of backing out, said, oh, the town wants it, maybe I'll develop it then. And then they go, well, who wanted to live next to, a, next to a firehouse? Well, my idea is to say, hey, pick this, school, this schoolhouse up, put it onto a flatbed, this is not very big, truck it to the cemetery, and they can use that as a historic building for the site. Um, and see, so keeping historic properties, but requiring this and not having a use for it just has scenes of the house out here, the house at, at um, Morrison, that we acquire these properties and we don't have any use for the, for the property, for the, for the building that we're acquiring with no clear vision. And that seems kind of like the way we walk with um, River Street as well. So there's been nothing brought to CPC for okay. River Street property. And well, we have a, a committee going, and it's like, well, it doesn't, it, to me, it doesn't seem to be gaining any traction. So there's, there's some questions of, the, um, of what's going to happen with that. But that, that, that proposal was, was pulled. Um, they're running consensus right now on funding the open space set aside at about 420 to 450,000. With some people going up as high as half a million. Um, so that if anything does come up, they will be able to go right in for it. So basically, kind of what what's happening. Um, RSH, RSHO, the housing office that they use for the affordable housing, etc. Um, they're looking at only funding that again for one year. It was requested for two. So. Um, so they're still in their deliberations of where they're headed. Are they going to be done by the 27th? I don't know, but Walter wants to know what time we can have them in, so I figured it would probably, probably be 7.30. And then give them quarter of eight, quarter of just eight. in case somebody shows up and we... We'll do. All right. Other committee reports? Christine? 
So the school committee met. Um, uh, Katie Neville announced that she is leaving the school committee. She's actually moving away. So uh, that means that the um, election there'll be two from Boxborough and two from ACT in open positions on the school committee. Um, they uh, got approval for um, from MSBA um, for 990 students if we go forward with the twin school, which was actually more than even our own projections uh, the last time we put the numbers to them. So they actually see even more growth than we saw ourselves. Uh, there are three finalists for the Miriam Principal position. They are all women. And uh, from what I understand, they're very strong candidates. Uh, and then the last thing is that Sudbury is naming their new superintendent on March 15th. They are on the same trajectory we are on. So there is a bit of energy behind the superintendent search at this time. Yeah. Uh, I noticed in the beacon there was a big celebration. Congratulations that we're going to have many more students than <laughs> was projected. And I'm thinking at 10 grand a person? No? 14 grand. I had the same reaction. It Why was, is this good news? It was just amazing. And then town manager? Sure, folks. Sure. Um, we have, we received uh, about 50, approximately 58 um, uh, applications. And at a meeting last week, we narrowed it down to 17. Um, the uh, next step that was recommended by our uh, consultants was an essay challenge to those 17 where we sent them out, we figured out four, four essay questions that were reasonably short, they wouldn't scare anybody away. And um, we're due to have those, um, I think it's what, at the end of next week, the 22nd. Yeah. And then we're meeting again on, on March 1st to determine the people that we will interview and we anticipate then having a series of evening interviews on March 6, 7, and 8. And then uh, following those three nights, we will meet again and send up three to five finalists to the uh, Board of Selectmen. All right? You are, absolutely. We won't necessarily interview all 17. We, we, we hope the essay questions will knock the, the field down to about nine or 10. Yes, Mike. The Minuteman <clears throat> budget seems to still be in good shape and um, because of the uh, <clears throat> uh, value engineering that has taken place as well as the uh, conservative structure of, put in place with the budget, yeah, they're starting to look at things that from the <clears throat> educational requirements and, and would be nice to have versus, the, versus must have, they're starting to look at some of those items to put back in. <clears throat> things that they pulled from the budget initially that they didn't think they can afford now uh, because of their frugality and budget control, they <clears throat> they're going to start looking at some of those items. Uh, and they're all educationally related. The other thing is these, the permit fee with the town of Lincoln, they got down from 1.3 million to 1.1 million, but it's not over yet. <clears throat> we still think that's uh, a, an outrageous amount of, that's um, a, <clears throat> a, a big fee. And they did a survey of uh, surrounding school districts and 80% of the respondents said that either uh, for school building permit fees, they were either um, deeply discounted or even waived completely. So uh, the superintendent now is trying to build a case that uh, really what the town of Lincoln is charging the district is a tax, which is he, they have no right to do, uh, but <clears throat> stay tuned. Yeah. Any other committee reports? Dave? Mr. Chair, I move that we adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> Second. Was that seconded by somebody other than Dave? <laughs> it's non debatable. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.
945. That's my. Uh, <laughs>